Welcome to episode two of the Heathen History Podcast. My name is Lauren. And I'm Ben. And we are here, we're talking about... Elsa Christensen. And Elsa Christensen is an interesting figure, I think. She's the link between Rudd Mills, who we talked about last week, and modern heathenry in many ways. And you can't tell the story of modern heathenry without looking at her life and her career. And if you haven't listened to the first episode where we talk about Red Mills... I will cry. Yeah. You should go listen to it because it it provides a lot of background that I think you're not going to get without having actually listened to that and understanding what he believed and hearing us sing uh, Odin, Odinic hymns. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Don't miss the Odinic hymn. Yes, it's great. So hmm. Elsa Christensen, just to kind of give you a brief intro, was the founder of uh, the Odinic Fellowship, which was really kind of the first major heathen or heathen adjacent organization in North America. It's interesting as to just to what extent you could call it heathen in the sense that many of our listeners would intend it. But uh, we'll talk about that when it comes up. So she was born in 1913 in uh, Eichberg, Denmark. Right. And I probably butchered that pronunciation. I apologize to that one Danish listener we have. Uh, It's, uh, what is it? E-S-B-J-E-R-G. Yes. Um, You know, the... uh, other Scandinavians think that Danish is particularly uh, harsh. Uh, the joke that they tell is that the proper way to speak Danish is to uh, stuff a potato in your mouth and speak Swedish. Uh, so I don't have a potato, so I assume it's pronounced, if I use my fist, it's probably something like, oh, well. There we go. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry, got it stuck. All right, Esbjerg so, in Denmark. Yes, so we don't know a ton about her life. As her childhood, other than, you know, the very few things that have been in. And a lot of our podcast is going to be based on a very in-depth interview that was done with her in Vortru. Right, in Vortru in 1993. And I happen to have a copy right here. And I'm holding it up to the microphone so you can see it. Yes. Wait, wait. That doesn't work. Oh, oh, it's a microphone? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm riffling the pages uh, there in front of the microphone so you can hear... Uh, that I've actually got this. And she says, as of 1993, uh, that she had been confirmed in the Lutheran Church, as uh, virtually all Danes would have been uh, at the time. She ended up leaving the Lutheran Church, never having really felt any strong uh, desire for religious belief. I believe uh, she was confirmed into the church when she was 14, and by the time she was like 17, she had left. Right. And when she became an adult, she very specifically left that because in Denmark, along with a lot of other places, there are church taxes. Right. So if you are not a member of the church, if you register as, as nothing, then you, you, know, you don't have to pay the church tax, but you do lose the right to be buried, apparently for free, in the church graveyard. Right. Right, and so she left the church, did not have much of an inclination towards being a Lutheran. No, and neither do I, so that's okay. Okay, right. So she graduated high school in 1932, mm-hmm. and then moved to Copenhagen, and she attended a school for two years for weaving. Right. Yeah, she was a hand weaver. Yes. Uh, ran a little shop at one point. And for a while, she worked at a place that was was actually sponsored by the queen at that time, Alexandra. Right. Where they promoted handcrafts, not just weaving, but weaving, sewing, all of that stuff, which I find kind of interesting that it kind of sounds like, say, oh, kids today don't know how to do all these things. And it seems like it was a similar situation in the 30s. Right. And uh, when that started, I think, becoming physically difficult for her, she uh, did some teaching for a while. She Mm -hmm. taught at an institute, uh, an institute for people with dyslexia, that also offered night classes for for adults. That's so awesome. She, she was a weaver. Uh, she was a teacher. And uh, she married. Uh, she was born Elsa Oxner and married uh, Mr. Christensen. Usually goes by Alex or Alexander Christensen. Uh, however, his first name was actually spelled A-A-G-E. And I was afraid that this was going to be unpronounceable, that it was going to be pronounced something like arg, uh, or with my fist in my mouth, or something like that. But it's actually quite easy to say. We actually got a uh, friend and fellow Troth member uh, from Denmark 
uh, who recorded the way you pronounce A-A-G-E in uh, Danish. And here he is. The name is pronounced O. So, yeah, that turned out to be quite simple. His name was O. But he went by Alex. So I, I think, yeah, I'm going to go with, with Alex. Alex. So she married, um, and Alex Christensen was a professional wood carver. So they were both artistic, worked with their hands kind of stuff, which is, is cool. They're, I think mm-hmm. they have that in common with a lot of other heathens. There's a lot of heathens that are crafters in some way. Mm-hmm. Now, her husband, they were very heavily politically involved. Um, at one point, they ran, they were part of the anarcho syndicalist movement. Right. And syndicalism... I'm not a political scientist, and I hate to talk about political movements because my experience has been that people are sometimes extremely touchy uh, about being identified as an X when they're actually a Y. And so I'm half expecting that one of our listeners might write in and say, you call them an anarcho-syndicalist and they were actually a Prudhonian anarchist or something like that. But syndicalism is essentially a labor movement that gives power to workers, uh, power to labor unions. Uh, They use general strikes as a uh, main strategy. Uh, Some of you may actually know the most famous uh, anarcho-syndicalist in uh, pop culture. You know know who that is? No, I don't know who that is. Uh, Dennis, uh, the peasant from Monty Python and Ah, the Holy Grail. Yes. You know, the one who says, we're an anarcho-syndicalist commune. We take it in turns to act as a sort of executive officer for the week, but all the decisions of that officer have to be ratified at a special bi-weekly meeting. That was basically um, Elsa Christensen's group. What we can say for sure, though, right. is that she was a member of the Strasbourg wing of the National Socialist Workers' Party of Denmark. Mm-hmm. That is her own words. We can... Right. Well, I think she'd started as an anarcho-syndicalist. Right. And can I just say, you can't expect to wield supreme executive power just because some watery top threw a sword at you. I wanted to include that completely gratuitously. Yes, That yes, was yes. our anarcho-syndicalist. Uh, Alex, or Olha, if you'd rather, was the one who had been a uh, Strasserite. And the Strasserites were founded by these Strasser brothers, logically enough, I suppose, uh, in Germany. And they were at one time loyal members of the Nazi party, but Strasserism tends to blend features of communism with features of fascism. Uh, So you have the same desire for a great national renewal, uh, renewing the nation, and of course, getting rid of the Jews, which the Nazis were big on coupled with an anti-capitalist views, taking power away from business owners and returning it to the workers. That, in fact, uh, led to some of the issues that she and her husband had during the occupation of right. Denmark, where her husband was actually interred for six months and was in mm-hmm. an internment camp for his affiliations because while they were socialists, they put the socialists in national socialism. Mm-hmm. They were very anti, um, anti-fuhrer anti principle. Mm-hmm. They did not like that the national socialists in Germany, that Hitler was essentially a dictator. Mm-hmm. They wanted decentralized. It's almost like classical libertarian states' rights. Mm-hmm. Um, it very much though this idea of decentralization of power. Anti-capitalism, they were very against capitalism because they, she believed it fostered materialism, favors individual enrichment over folk solidarity, and exploits nature for short-term profit. Right. Uh, people at the time with beliefs like this were sometimes affectionately referred to as beefsteak Nazis. Go ahead, yeah. ask me why. Why? Uh, because they were brown on the outside and red on the inside. Uh, nice. Thunum Ching. Yeah. Do you think we could edit in a little... Yeah, rim probably, shot right there? Probably. Okay. Not my joke. It was the joke people made back in the 30s. But she was, very, like I said, very much about paleogenic ultranationalism. Right. Which palingenetic is, or palingenetic. Means, yeah, I don't pronounce things right. You know. No, it's okay. Palingenetic basically means rebirth, renewal, you know, not just supporting your nation completely, uh, but leading it to some sort of grand national rebirth that will get it back on track, back in tune with what it was supposed to be, making Germany great again, as it were. Uh, I'm just going to read this here, and these are some 
This is some textbook stuff I got. Their strategies was basically attract a large mass of voters who have lost their faith in traditional politics and religion by promoting a brighter future. I'm just going to leave that there with no comment. Just going to leave it there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fascinating, Captain. Yes. So it's the idea, and this is from Roger Griffin in Staging the Nation's Rebirth. It promises to replace gerontocracy, mediocrity, and national weakness with youth, heroism, and national greatness. To banish anarchy and decadence and to bring order and health. To inaugurate an exciting new world in place of the played out one that existed before. To put government in the hands of outstanding personalities instead of non-entities. Right. That's basically fascism? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Fascism can be defined as a core myth of national rebirth. Right. So, yeah, pretty much. So um, if you blend that with giving power to the workers, you've got strasserism. Which right. I would just like to say, since Miley Cyrus is not here, I'll have to sing this for her. You've got the worst of both worlds. First we'll kill off the Jews, then the capitalists too. The worst of both worlds. Mix it all together and you know it's a... Okay, yeah, I'll that's stop. Good. I, good. I can't do that for a full, no, a no, full verse. No, no. Sorry about that. I probably just killed off our Patreons for... Uh, a week or two. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, and then, of course, add into all of this, there was also this idea of, like I said, their their decentralization of government. And all of this, we're going to see all this come back into play in the future when the Odenic Fellowship is being formed and her ideas about, you know, what an Odenic community should be. So she was arrested in 1943 and she and her husband both detained for illegal possession of firearms. And accused of being leading an underground group. And if I remember correctly, uh, she used a relative that she had that had some power to get them out of that. Right. She was not interned for very long. Right. Uh, was- he was interned for about uh, six months. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had a detention camp at uh, Elsinore, which I think is Helsingborg or something like that. But anyway, it's the same place where Hamlet is supposedly set. And according to... Her own statements in the interview in Vortru, for the most part, she claims that she stayed neutral during World War II. Right. She didn't particularly care for Hitler, again, because he was a dictator. He was not elected by the Danes. Uh, She felt he should have stayed in Germany and uh, pretty much left them alone. Yeah, she writes here in uh, the interview where she says, uh, We stayed neutral during the occupation. We did not want to support the Germans because they were a foreign power on Danish soil. Uh, We did not want to work against them either because we were not really that interested. Uh, We did not approve of the war as such. The German population had elected legally Hitler as their leader, and we thought that it was their business and not ours, uh, nor anyone else's. Which, you know, once again, I've done so much reading for this. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of this. If you look back at the appeasement policies prior to the really the start of World War II, I mean that was a lot of Europe's thing was mm-hmm. like you know well that's that's their problem, mm-hmm. not ours. You know they were there was very much a appeasement of Hitler rather than go to war for quite a while. Right. Well, I mean people could still remember the uh, First World War oh, yeah. and the terrible devastation that had caused. Nobody was really spoiling for another fight so soon, I don't think. No. It's interesting. I just came across this in the interview that when she was talking about this in 1993, the interviewer asked what was fringe about his, Alex's, political activities. And she says, quote, I cannot explain that unless you know the political climate. It would not make sense for people here. It was just that we were politically active, just as there are small groups here that are politically active, and that is all. And obviously, the occupation powers had no idea which way we would turn, so at one time they rounded up all communists, other extremists of various types, and Alex was in that bunch also. So what she may be doing in hindsight, you know, 50-some years after uh, after the fact, is maybe downplaying... Uh, Alex's political affiliations. And, you know, they did run a coffee house uh, meeting place for the quote-unquote political fringe, Mm -hmm. as I make the little air quotes that you can't see, in the late 1930s. 
So I do feel like, and we all do this. I'm, I'm going to say, you know, we all, I feel like there might be some revisionism in her own mind, but mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's just human nature. Right, right. Yeah, I'm not saying she's deliberately trying to whitewash anything, but, you know, after 50 years, you know, there may be some things that she's perhaps not so willing to talk about. Right. Anyway, so, so they get through the war. They get on a sailboat. Right. They actually owned a sailboat. And we're thinking about crossing the entire North Atlantic and coming to America or Canada. Uh, as it turned out, they ended up in England. Because sailing across the ocean is hard, y'all. Um, true. Elsa swore that the boat could have done it. Maybe so. Uh, but they stayed in England for a while, uh, sold the boat, and emigrated to Canada. Alex continued as a woodcarver. Elsa said that for a while she did what, you know, immigrants always do and worked in a restaurant mm-hmm. and eventually went into health care. Some of the news clippings that we have on her call her a nurse, but I don't think she was actually an RN with a, a nursing degree. Uh, she ended up working for a large hospital as a head of the records department for the uh, the x-ray department. And that's pretty much, I think, most of the sources that I've found come mm-hmm. down to she worked in some sort of capacity, healthcare administration capacity. Right. And just to, to throw some dates out here, uh, they spent two years in England. They mm-hmm. immigrated to England in 1949, and then they immigrated to Toronto mm-hmm. in 1951 where she ended up working as some sort of hospital administration jobs. Right, right. And she did that for 20 years until yes. she retired. So not really much there, that kind of 10-year span. However, during that time period, she starts getting involved with other, what, what do we want to call these people? Um, racists, mm-hmm. bigots. Well, there had been fascist sympathizers before, during, and after the war. They certainly Mm -hmm. didn't go away. Uh, She was strongly influenced by the ideas of a man by the name of Fred Yockey. Yes. Yockey was, by all accounts, a very intelligent man and a gifted musician, Uh, got a law degree from the University of Notre Dame, and apparently had always really sympathized with the fascist side. He ended up working for a time for the U.S. government, joining the legal team that was conducting the Nuremberg trials of leading Nazis in the aftermath of the war, and left after about a year of that, claiming, I believe, that the trials were terribly unjust and believing, I think, that the Germans had been right all along. Uh, to do what they'd done. But he ended up leading this sort of gypsy, wandering life, traveling from place to place, trying to build a fascist sympathetic movement in the U.S. And he wrote a book, uh, wrote the whole thing while he was lying low in Ireland for a while, uh, called Imperium. Yes. Which uh, builds on some work by a pre-war historian named Oswald Spengler, And I have not actually tracked down a copy of Imperium. My understanding is that the idea is that all cultures go through a natural process of birth, flowering, maturity, and then ultimate decay. And, you know, like the Roman Empire did, for example. And Western culture was on the cusp of a great flowering, but it was being held back uh, by various parasitic elements that were dragging it down. So the quote, he said that Aryan culture has reached its senility phase, ah. being held back by Christianity, communism, capitalism, and equality. And the erosion of racial cultural differences is what's causing all of this. Mm-hmm. Now, this is something that you're going to hear again. You heard it last week. You're going to hear it again. But he also put forth the idea of the culture soul which is a development of organic religious expression based on race and current, you know, the current kind of society. It was based on this idea of a pan-European race that kind of emerged from the multitude of white races in the 19th century. And he alleged that democracy, equality, feminism, humanism, capitalism, and communism were all, Mm. are you ready for it? A Jewish conspiracy. Yep. Huge fan of that. Mm -hmm. There's a whole very multi-headed trend of what's sometimes called third-way positions 
uh, that tend to draw to some extent on both communism and on uh, fascism. They tend to like the idea of a strong leader. They're distrustful of democracy and the people and the rabble. And uh, they tend to finger the uh, finger the Jews as the you know the people that are both simultaneously genetically inferior to us white Aryan folk and diabolically clever enough to destroy us with plots like capitalism and communism. I, I wish they could figure out which one it's supposed to be, but they're like Schrodinger's Jews. You know, I uh, I used to date a guy that was Jewish, and he would he one time he said. For all this power we allegedly have, no one's informed me how to tap into it. Mm -hmm. Now, because of this, she had been in contact with several, I guess you could call prominent racists in North Mm -hmm. America. So the first was uh, Willis Carto, who was kind of the one that introduced her to everyone else. Right. And he led a group called Liberty Lobby, which I don't know, makes me sound like he was trying to run a, um, you know, store with uh, craft supplies and things like that. Well, no, but that's it, actually Hobby Lobby. I, no, I always get those confused. Liberty Lobby sounds like, well, you know, something that like Jerry Falwell would run. Right. So he introduced her to James K. Warner. Mm-hmm. Although James K. Warner is... A Christian identity minister now. Right. For a while, anyway, he was working out of Metairie, Louisiana, or as we have to say, Metri. Metri, yes. Metri. I, I was very confused when you pronounced it Metairie. Mm-hmm. Because another thing, Ben and I have both lived in New Orleans. So mm-hmm. we, we have... Right, uh, so we have to call it Metri. Metri, yeah. But yes, he was working out of, of Metri. And he first, at some point, tried to start a... Odinic religion of some kind, mm-hmm. uh, somewhat based on A. Rudd Mill's right. writings. Yeah, I haven't found out much about this, but he was briefly the high priest of a mystical white supremacist religion that was called the Odinist Religion and Nordic Faith Movement. And um, I'm just going to go back to my point from last week. Mm-hmm. These people are really bad at naming things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he seems to have gotten a hold of A. Rudd Mills's writings. Right. And uh, he became disillusioned with this. He was hoping that Odinism might become the primary religion for national socialists. Uh, but he seems to have gotten disillusioned with it or lost interest. And he's the one who gave A. Rudd Mills's work uh, to Elsa Christensen. Right. Along with some other stuff. He had a bunch of Norse material right. that so he gave. He's- Right, so he's the link. He's the link. And that that really kind of where she starts looking at it. And of course, he ended up becoming a Christian identity uh, minister. I can't remember the exact uh, which version of Christian identity he got. But yeah. Um, and he also ran the, oh no, his other, his other name for it. You forgot about the other name for it. Oh, I did? The Sons of Liberty Odinist Religion. Oh, yes. okay. I forgot about that one. The Sons of Liberty Odinist Religion. At least as of 93, uh, Warner was running the new Christian Crusade Church in Metri. Metri. And uh, apparently uh, worked uh, back in uh, David Duke's clan days. David Duke was the uh, former head of a clan organization uh, who had got elected to the Louisiana legislature in 1988, I think it was, And then ran for governor in 1992 and got beat by Edwin Edwards, who'd been indicted twice for uh, financial crimes. I don't know if you were in Louisiana at the time, but I well remember the bumper stickers. Yeah, vote for the crook. It's important. Yeah, exactly. So So that was the kind of company that that he keeps, although he was apparently distributing Mills' book, despite leading the New Christian Crusade Church. He was listing it in his book catalog. Uh, at least as late as 1991. Even at that late date, he had not completely disavowed uh, that aspect of his past. So Elsa Christensen gets a hold of these books. Mm-hmm. She reads them, and she she liked it. She thought A. Rudd Mills had interesting ideas, but like so many other people who are deeply involved in these kind of movements, thought it was a little too influenced by Freemasonry. Mm-hmm. Because if it's not the Jews, it's the Freemasons, as we all know. According to the conspiracy theories of always. Yeah, in the uh, Vortru interview, Elsa actually, uh, she's quoted as writing, I am not an agnostic now. I was when I started out. It was a rational decision. 
uh, to see if Mills's idea of Odinism would work. I have since learned that our gods have great power. By this, I mean that if you are in contact with your instincts, which express the essence of our folk soul or the subconscious elements of Urd, which we have given mythological names such as Odin, Thor, Frey, or Balder, we are in contact with life itself. And that is a powerful reality that you can feel if you can ever, quote, feel a reality. So I'm not sure that she ever, how, whether she believed in gods as being out there. They seem to have been more in here, perhaps part of, you know, the human psyche, or right. at least the, the white European human psyche. But it's interesting. I, I wanted to read that into the record, as it were, because when she started out, she was not particularly uh, religious at all. She was she describes herself as agnostic, and was adopting Odinism basically to see if this would work as a religion for propagating her political views. I, I'm going to call it uh, what we would call it in the modern day. Mm -hmm. It's a social experiment. Mm -hmm. It really was for her a social, you know, and it actually kind of worked. So she and her husband, I'm going to be honest with you, I have a lot of conflicting dates on mm -hmm. when the Odin Od Od Fellowship was founded. I have read it was started in 1969. I've read that it started in 71, right after Alex died. Mm -hmm. So there are, and both of those are sources from her. So there's kind of conflicting information as to when this actually started. The oldest uh, issue of her newsletter uh, that I've got access to, uh, The Odinist, is the fourth one, and that's dated June of 1972. So the first episode, the first episode, the first issue of the Odinist came out in August of 1971, which we know is after Alex died. He died some point before that in 1971. We don't, I don't have an exact date on that. And it was put out eight times a year, uh, 10 typewritten pages. Mm -hmm. uh, at its circulation peak, it was being sent out to 800 people. It was published for 100, for 151 issues. For 21 mm -hmm. years. Right. And I wish I had some original copies that I could hold up to the microphone and flip the pages, but I'm afraid I lost that eBay auction. So, yeah, yeah I don't have any original Odinists I can read through. But she did publish, and you just sent these to me this week, and so I had a chance to read through them. She pu published a, a second newsletter for not very long, right, called The Sun Wheel? Yeah, she published a second newsletter at the same time she was putting out The Odinist, and the content difference between the two is not great. I'm not really sure why she was publishing two uh, at once, but it's called The Sun Wheel, and she put out at least 22 issues between mm -hmm. 1972 and 1975. So at the same time that she's publishing uh, The Odinist, she's publishing a second journal called The Sun Wheel. Uh, most of the content in The Sun Wheel is unsigned, but in uh, the latest issue that I have access to, uh, issue 22, it says Managing Editor E. Christensen uh, at the bottom of the last page. Yeah, I, I don't really, after, you know, and I, I read through those, you got them to me this week, I don't really see much of a difference. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say, having read through all those issues of the Sun Wheel and all of the issues that you got me of the Odinist, mm -hmm. I have come to the conclusion that a lot of her writing was very proto Alex Jones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sounds a mild mannered, grandmotherly Danish Alex Jones. I mean, sounds about right. Yeah, you know, there was all of this stuff about how public schools are a communist conspiracy. Yeah. What one of that issue was devoted almost entirely to that, that that brave white guy in Nevada who was resisting the attempts of the state to force his kids into public school. I, I know you're talking about but yeah. it's not it's not it's not coming to me. Yeah, it, it tends to blend in together for a while. Most of the content of the Odinist had Nothing obvious to do with religion uh, at all. There wasn't anything as to how to actually go about worshiping the gods. Certainly no ritual scripts or anything like that. And not a lot about religion or even Norse culture. Most of it was analysis of history, sociology, and politics from this right-wing slash third-way position that he had. And I need to read some of this into the record. Yes. 
I've got a copy of uh, the Oded is number 35 uh, from 1978. And most of the issue is dedicated to a third position analysis of Star Wars, which had just come out, as I well remember. And uh, I have to quote this, the tremendous worldwide success of the book and movie Star Wars is a heartening demonstration that Aryan myth, which transmits Aryan heroic dynamism, Aryan mysticism, and Aryan theotechnics, whatever that is, can excite a massive wave of enthusiasm among our culturally starved kinsmen. For in many salient respects, Star Wars is, like the works of Robert E. Howard, a modern version of our old Aryan values of soul-impulsive ideals, where value and self-reliance figure prominently. And I think I'm going to stop there, because yeah, there's only so much of this I can take. It's... wow. Mm-hmm. Like, and it goes on like this for pages about how Star Wars is this great, you know, work of, you know, white power literature. Ten, and it's stupid. Ten pages. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. It's not, I mean, Lando, hello. Mm -hmm. The well, smoothest guy in the Star Wars universe. But well, yeah, but that that's was, the point. That was in the sequel. That yes. was in The Empire Strikes Back. It's true. This is before I was which born. Is, which is probably when the Jews got their hands on it or something. I don't know. Uh, did she forget about Steven Spielberg? <laughs> let's, let's, yeah, logical consistency here is perhaps not the strong point. Oh, but yeah, that. But in, in, yeah, there there was another issue that was entirely dedicated to modern art, concluding, if memory serves, that it was all a conspiracy to um, destroy the soul of the white man. And uh, Mark Chagall, who was Jewish, came in for special abuse. But again, there was. Some vague suggestions to read the Eddas and things like that, but very little content that you could actually call religious. Although, in the second issue of The Odinist Ever Published, there was a little piece on something called The Guard in God, which, if you remember from the last podcast, is A. Rudd Mills's idea. The idea that the gods have given you this particular sphere that you're supposed to stay in and this work that you're supposed to do and that you're supposed to stick with. So we know Elsa Christensen had read Rudd Mills and had borrowed some concepts, but most of what he's writing about is coming from people like Oswald Spengler and uh, Fred Yockey and sources like that. It's not really much of a religious movement. So it, it would be definitely was seen more as a... Jungian collective unconsciousness, as we said earlier. It was known at one point in time as the Odinist movement, of course, the Odinist fellowship, and mm -hmm. the Odinist community. Right. In um, one of the later Odinist issues, number 91, she simply writes, We conceive of gods as being the force throughout the universe which controls gravity, rotates the planets, and makes the stars shine in accordance with natural law. So I like this. We conceive of gods as being the force throughout the universe. It surrounds us and penetrates us and binds the galaxy together. I, th I think I've figured out why she likes Star Wars so much. I was going to say she she clearly thought that the gods were duct tape. Mm. You know, have the light side and dark side and it holds everything together. No, no. As someone with Nazi connections, she would not uh, want to acknowledge the existence of the dark side. Fair. Fair. Mm. fair. All right. It's got to be the white side of the so force. So, um, did I just say that? <laughs> yes, you did. Yeah. Uh, so their focus was much more on producing this literature and also then ideas about ceremony and ritual. Uh, they celebrated five holy days, the four seasonal symbols. Right. And, and Hitler's, Hitler's birthday. birthday. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Isn't there we Hitler's go. Hitler's birthday the same day as Weed Day. What, 420? Yeah. You know, I think it is. I, I would rather celebrate Weed Day. Yeah, yeah. Between yeah. the two, yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, I mean, well, you know, I would personally probably not celebrate either one, because, you know, man, I've got the straight edge! It's the, we. you're celebrating the eve of the eve of Earth Day. Oh, okay. There there, that makes perfect sense. So, uh, there were no, it was very much discounted any kind of UPG self-experiential uh, encounters, magic, in favor of kind of some academics... I and mean, that was really kind of a big part of it. There was very little in the, like, 
Wu. Wu was not really a part of their thing. Well, she says this in uh, 1993 in the uh, interview in Vortru again. Although I at present do not deal with rituals and rune lore, I'm certainly aware of both and agree that they are part of our ancient religion. I'm simply not able to deal with them, so I leave them be until somebody appears who can do so in a way I can accept as the closest to the real thing when my instincts tell me they are. So, yeah, very much more interested in social issues than in developing what we think of as a religion approach. And, you know, one thing that she would say, she saw Odinism as a, this is a German word, and I've got a, a pronunciation here. Uh, Weltanschauung? Yes, or worldview. Right. It was not about religion as much as it was about she even, you know, said that you know she saw a pagan approach to racial rejuvenization as superior to militant action. Right. So, and from what there were a lot of what I would call veiled racist message. Mm-hmm. Although I'm going to be fair to mm-hmm. her, she has said in multiple, you know, in her interviews in that Vorture interview, you know, that she did not consider herself a racist. She just considered. That, and I believe the belief here would be, she really thought that no person would choose to cooperate with another race or ethnicity. And the role of Odinism is clear. The pathogens must be destroyed and healthy organisms raised to serve the purpose of Aryan spiritual liberation and all-around advancement. And that's from the Odinist number 82 for an article called Odinism Religion of Relevance. Right. But there's an interview with her that's published in uh, Matthias Gardell's book, Gods of the Blood, where she says, I don't think that anybody mistook my opinions from what we wrote in The Odinist, but nobody could put a finger on what we said because we said it in a way that it couldn't be clamped down at. Everybody knows that the Jews rule the whole damned world, so you cannot fight their combined power. You need to watch your step. So there, I think she got a little bit unguarded. Yeah. And then she was a proponent, which will, once again, is in this idea of the Aryan folk soul, Mm -hmm. and that Odinism was an expression of something very primordial. It is biological and encoded into our genes, which after we wrap up, you know, these, this next few episodes are going to be about also Christians. And, and then I think we're going to, we're going to have a little talk about metagenetics before we dive into Steve McNallan. Mm, Looking forward to it already. Ben is, uh, Ben, Ben has a PhD in this thing called biology. Yeah. And so. And then, you know, very much kind of believed in retribalization. And that was the other thing that I found really interesting. That actually, and when I started reading through this, as someone who is very much a proponent of the tribal expression of heathenry, Mm -hmm. I had to sit and actually question my own beliefs for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because some of this I did have in common with her. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's a difference in how we view that tribalism that makes a difference. Right. Well, there's more than one issue that, you know, raging hippies like myself and elements of the far right could actually find common ground on, environmental protection uh, being one of them, albeit possibly for very different reasons. Localism, supporting your local people, concern about giant global corporations removing autonomy, you know, those are things that people worry about across the spectrum. Well, I mean, for instance, if I read, I will read through here, and I've got a list of kind of what she believed in regard to this. I'm going to read through here. I'm going to read through just all of the things that I agree with. Freedom of self-expression, freedom Mm -hmm. of private enterprise, encouragement for everyone to reach their full potential. The idea that man is very social and really can only reach their full potential through Mm -hmm. community. Now, Here's the problem. A lot of hers, it, she adds in racial community. Mm-hmm. Homogenous. Only ethnically homogenous society can provide all of these things. That I disagree. But, you know, to me, as someone who is very much, you know, a proponent of that very kind of neo-tribalism from a liberal mm-hmm. perspective, you know, where I am very community focused, or we're a family, and at the same time, I think we encourage everyone to be involved. I mean, just last weekend we were out at a fundraiser for one of our kindred brothers was and his wife were running. I mean, I think that that's incredibly important. And it is interesting when we come mm-hmm. across these things, when we're reading about people who are such polar opposites, people especially who 
are racist mm. or whatever, I do have to examine my beliefs yeah. and make sure what I believe, I believe for the right reasons. Mm. And it's not some sort of baggage from where we came from. Right. And people on the focus side of the things are responding to a lot of the same stresses that we are. You know, they want community too. They want a support network, something that's eroded a lot in America over the past uh, 70 years or so. You know, they want to reach their full potential, and there's not a thing wrong with that. The problem comes when you start taking something arbitrary like race and sticking it into the whole thing. But they're responding in what they do to a lot of the same things that we're responding to, although I think we're doing a more humane job of it. I agree. Mm -hmm. And I I think that it's definitely, it's important because Mm -hmm. one thing that I think I forget sometimes, I have to remind myself, even to people who just believe politically different, Mm -hmm. we all want the same things. We all want happiness and freedom and prosperity. We just want, we just believe we have different ways of achieving it. Mm -hmm. And I think when you look at that, and, and this will come up especially more in the next episode. People are complicated. And I know sometimes we want Mm -hmm. to look at these people who are racist, horrible Mm -hmm. people, and we want to say they're good or bad. But for all of the racist beliefs that at least Christians have had, she had a lot of really good ones. She was super into the environment and super eco-conscious and actually was rejected by a lot of the other white supremacist, white pride, white power, whatever you want to call it, people at that time. Because of her ideas of communalism and anti-Marx communalism Mm -hmm. and eco-consciousness that were not popular in most Mm -hmm. of those far-right movements. Yeah, I think we have to resist the temptation to put a black hat or a white hat on everybody. I think you are quite right. People are just more complicated bundles of, you know, disparate and sometimes contradictory ideas and certainly I have no sympathy at all with uh, Elsa Christensen's racial agenda. That doesn't mean that she is an irredeemably evil person who should just be kicked to the curb. She did a great deal for the foundations of heathenry. And we need to look at that uh, with a critical eye, but not trying to cast her out as some sort of demon. And I think we need to resist the temptation to completely other people who do not have the views that we do. We can disagree, but not write them off as utterly unworthy, uh, as never having produced anything but badness. And now you read the last half of this quote, but I want to read the first half to kind of close out this first episode. But she wrote letters following up this interview. To understand my approach to Odinism, one simply has to realize that only when one knows all aspects of an ideology can one choose wisely. If you only know half of it, you're out of balance. Odinism, to the consternation of many people, Odinist as well as non-Odinist, is not dogmatic. We will have to agree upon and tolerate same, several main interpretations of Osatru Odinism denominations. Eventually, I believe it will all come together. I agree with that. I mean, we yeah. that's one of the things I do like about being in the troth is mm-hmm. that, you know, we do tolerate a lot of different... You, know, you have everything from us. We're pretty... I would say we're pretty, we're on the reconstructionist end, pretty pretty solidly reconstructors, all the way to people who are like way out there in their own happy, mm. completely making it up as they go, and that's cool. So, I'm, an, I'm an evolutionary biologist. I figure that what is most suited for the environment that we're in will eventually survive, and what isn't will eventually disappear, and it's ultimately not up to me. Yeah, realizing this is the reason why I pretty much stop freaking out about people who were doing it wrong because they weren't the boss of me. (laughs) Right. But it will eventually shake itself out in the God's good time. And I try to do the best that I can. And you try to do the best that you can. And in the end. Well, I mean, I always say heathenry is a religion of attraction. My goal in life is to be such an awesome heathen, to have Mm -hmm. such an awesome life. Mm-hmm. That people look at us and they want to be a part of us. And that's what happened. I mean, we don't go out and recruit as a Kendrick, mm-hmm. but people come to us. They want to be a part of what we're doing because we're just that cool, guys. That's a good goal. 
My goal is to destroy the last of the North American forests and turn them into paper for the printing of my books. But yours is a good goal, too. And speaking of books, if you want to know about, Ben has lots of books. Um, the latest book that you have, of course, being Garb and Gear, mm -hmm. which tells you everything you need to know to make everything you would want to wear. Right. You know who wouldn't have approved of Garb and Gear? Elsa Christensen. She was anti-Garb. Right. I, I find that funny because that's an argument that's still going on. Mm -hmm. So in the next episode, we'll be back in two weeks and we're going to talk about the establishment of the Odenic Fellowship in prisons. We're going to talk about Elsa Christensen's arrest and trial and imprisonment, as well as her work post-imprisonment and the impact that she had after courts. So just to let you know, if you want to support us, though, go visit our Patreon. We've got sneak peeks, special gifts, and we even have an exclusive Heathen History Facebook group. And that will get you a chance to ask Ben all the questions you want. He might answer. He might not. Uh, go to patreon.com forward slash Heathen History and find out about that. And you can follow us on Twitter at Heathen History or Facebook at facebook.com slash Heathen History uh, for updates. And as always, our show notes and sources are available on our website, heathenhistory.com. Our theme music is Happy Viking by Roller Music. Our show is edited by Hands on Keyboard. And for the Heathen History Podcast, I'm Lauren. And I'm Ben. Wassail, y'all. Wassail,